I failed the AP computer science exam in high school. I got a one out of five. I also got a C on my first project in college and I struggled to solve two sub on the code easy for months. Yet somehow I managed to get six high paying software engineering internship offers and multiple six figure software engineering full-time offers by age 22. So how is that even possible? Well, it's because I learned the unwritten rules of the game. In this video, I'm giving you 24 brutally honest software engineering lessons I wish I knew before 24. The truth about why being a great coder isn't enough, how to master the actual hiring process itself, and the core mindset shifts that turn an average student into a 10x software engineer. This compilation will save you a decade of trial and error. Let's get into it. Lesson one is that programming skills are not enough. Now, most people overemphasize coding ability, often called value creation, but don't realize that it's only half of the equation for career success. That half is only software engineering. The other equally vital half is called value capture, which involves mastering the strategic elements of the job acquisition process. Many talented builders or engineers mistakenly over-optimize their raw technical skills while neglecting how to effectively sell themselves to employers. The fundamental error is this, you believe that your pure engineering skills are enough to guarantee a top job. But companies actually operate based on Peter Thiel's value paradox. They pay you, for instance, $100,000 because they often generate one to $5 million of value from your work. Value capture skills allow you to actually capture some of the value you create for companies by mastering skills that are independent of coding, like effective interviewing, resume presentation, negotiation, and building professional relationships. Lesson number two is to optimize for optics and experience. Recruiters prioritize a relevant work experience above almost everything else, including educational attainment or GPA. In fact, recruiters spend only seven seconds scanning your resume. Therefore, you want to optimize for optics or making your experience look as good as possible because that's essential to gain momentum. This strategy exploits something called the halo effect, where an impressive first look leads recruiters to assume the rest of the application is strong. It's like when you see a guy on the street in a suit, you immediately assume that this person is some kind of lawyer, accountant, or professional. Your experience needs to be framed using strong action verbs, technical jargon, and tangible numbers. For instance, a low-level high school internship involving moving broken computers to a dumpster was successfully framed by me as an IT engineering internship. The core principle is to be as outrageous as you can defend. You want to maximize the technical appearance of any role, so clubs, research, volunteer positions without, of course, outright lying. Surveys confirm that recruiters rank years of experience and type of experience as way more important than education level. Lesson number three is to master referrals. Referrals are considered the secret sauce of getting a job in tech and are crucial for cutting through the noise of mass applications. Data shows that referred candidates are up to 700%, seven times more likely to get a job compared to people who cold apply. And this is due to a significant asymmetry. While only five to 10% of applicants to large companies like Google have a referral, 30 to 50% of the people hired had a referral. You must strategically build your network, leveraging platforms like LinkedIn and Blind. LinkedIn provides an unparalleled directory for locating employees at target companies. Blind, another anonymous verified platform for tech employees, can be leveraged as well by searching for specific companies and messaging individuals directly to request a referral. Referrals are essential because employees are often incentivized with bonuses to refer successful candidates. Lesson number four is the applicant's fallacy trap. The applicant's fallacy is the common mistake of believing that acquiring more technical skills like learning a fifth programming language or building unnecessarily complex personal projects is the primary solution to unemployment. This is flawed because for approximately 75% of the struggling candidates, the main issue is the inability to secure interviews, not pass them. Over-optimizing on technical knowledge fails to address the bottlenecks in value capture, such as poor resume or inadequate application volume. Instead, you should focus on securing real-world experiences such as technical club roles, hackathons, or research, as these are way more valuable on a resume than solo projects built in your bedroom. Lesson number five is what I call the stairway to software heaven. The big thing to focus on here is you need to set realistic career goals by adopting this approach. This means not jumping steps of the journey directly to highly competitive companies like Fang or Quant, and instead you want to focus on climbing the hierarchy incrementally, starting with local or regional companies, which we call level zero or one, use those experience to land offers at mid-level companies, and only then go for top companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, or Jane Street. 
For example, my experience here started with a local insurance company, which led to a larger regional company called John Deere, and subsequently opened doors to Amazon and Shopify. The reason you want to use that strategy is simple. If you have no experience and you're spamming applications to companies like Google or Meta, you have no chance of making it there. But if you instead spread the journey over a few years, start with a small company, then go for a mid-level, and then go for a fang, you're way more likely to succeed. Lesson number six is that timing is everything and you must understand market cycles. See, the tech market is cyclical meaning applications must be timed strategically. You usually want to apply as early as possible, often in July or August of the previous summer before you actually start upon graduation. And most companies operate on a rolling basis for hiring. So applying early ensures less competition and more open seats. This leverages your first mover advantage. The peak hiring window for internships and new grads generally occurs in the fall semester. So October and November, meaning preparation such as resume, Lead code and networking should actually begin months before, usually in the summer. See, applying early when the application first opens up, up to a year in advance, is often a key factor in terms of getting internships. When I got my Amazon internship, it was because I applied a year early. Now that you know about the hiring game, let's talk about the mindset that drives execution. Lesson seven is to adopt the mindset of infinite evolution. This principle is an advanced version of the growth mindset, which is rooted in the deep-seated belief that almost any trait whether it's intelligence, coding ability, looks, or social skills is a skill that can be deliberately acquired and improved. You should adopt the mentality of an AI robot who's constantly analyzing the success of others. When you see someone successful, whether they're a software engineer at a company like Google or they're super jacked in the gym, your immediate action should be to identify specific repeatable behaviors, analyze them, implement them, and strive to surpass them. This mindset shift allowed me to land multiple FANG level internships while also making gains in the gym and working on pretty much every area of my life. Lesson number eight is to stop procrastinating and start now. You're ready for whatever challenge you want to face. See, you probably have an inner voice urging you to wait until you're 100% prepared. For example, you feel like you need to finish a project, master every single lead code medium, or get into your junior year. And that voice is procrastination. This procrastination results in years of wasted opportunity and lost momentum. You should be ready to apply immediately, even if you're a freshman in college, even if you're a senior in high school, if you want to get into the software engineering field, especially if you feel completely unqualified. Starting early, even with minimal skills, is crucial if you want to land high quality experiences later on in your career. Lesson number nine is that you must be abnormal to achieve abnormal results. To achieve top 1% results, for example, six-figure jobs in your 20s or really anything else in life like being incredibly jacked, you cannot live a normal life. Normal behaviors like excessive drinking, consistent poor sleep, frequent gaming, or eating poorly often lead to mediocre normal outcomes. If you want to obtain abnormal results, it demands abnormal commitment and often requires sacrificing short-term social comfort and adopting a structured, highly disciplined routine. Lesson 10 is that you'll want to raise your standards in pretty much all areas of life. Essentially, you want to over-deliver. Your standard of work is likely insufficient if you want to reach the top 1%. You must always aim for 120% delivery, pushing the ceiling, because real-world mistakes, tight deadlines, and unexpected problems will inevitably pull your output down to around 95%. The guiding principle here is to under -promise and over deliver. And that way you'll exceed minimum expectations. So a couple of examples where you can use this principle are, let's say you're studying for a midterm in your operating systems class. If you only aim to know maybe 85 or 90% of the material, that doesn't mean you're going to get a 90%. That means you'll get a 60% because the exam will have questions that you didn't prepare for. Instead, if you optimize for 120%, going beyond even what the material requires, then you'll end up with a 90 or 95%. Similarly, when doing a software engineer role or internship, Internship, if you only aim to just finish your project and you just don't factor uncertainty into the picture, you inevitably will not finish it completely. But instead, if you aim to finish two projects, you'll walk away with one and a half. Lesson number 11 is to accept rejection and to understand that the job market is a war zone. I call the tech job search a war zone because it's characterized by constant, repetitive rejection. You must expect failure. Some people need to submit over a thousand applications to get a single offer, even with two years of experience. The solution is to adopt systems thinking and emotionally separate yourself from individual outcomes. Instead of viewing each rejection as a personal failure, view it as a necessary probabilistic data point in a large system. And if you can't handle this feeling of failing over and over and over again, you're going to get burned out. Lesson number 12 is that your job offer is actually just a ticket 
to do a job. A lot of people think that if they land a high paying six figure job, every single problem in their life will be taken care of. And that's known as the arrival fallacy. That six figure job offer is merely a ticket to dedicate 40 to 50 hours a week of your prime time nine to five every single day towards achieving someone else's goal in exchange for a salary. You essentially sell Monday through Friday to give back Saturday and Sunday. True life satisfaction must be cultivated independently through deliberate focus on other areas of wealth. So time, social, physical, and mental health. If you don't enjoy coding, that salary alone will not provide happiness. Now, if you're listening to these lessons and you're thinking to yourself, Amon, I get all of this, but... I'm lost. I've applied to a bunch of software engineer internships or job, but truly have not received many responses back. Then you're exactly where I was five years ago. I had this vague idea of the strategy, but I lacked the consistency and accountability to execute it when the stakes were high. I wasted years trying to do this process alone. And that's why I created something called a software engineering accelerator. This is where you work directly with me and a team of fang level coaches, recruiters from Amazon, Bloomberg, and software engineers from Google, Microsoft, and Meta to install the ultimate system that will get you a job guaranteed on average in the next three to six months. And we don't just teach you the concepts, we do it all for you. We walk you through pretty much everything from rewriting your resume, building your LinkedIn, running through eight plus mock coding and behavioral interviews, helping with lead code and with salary negotiation once you get the offer. Like I said, if you're ready to lock in this fall and land your dream internship or job, check out the top link in the description. All right, lesson number 13 is that lead code is like going to the gym. You need to accept lead code as a necessary lifelong habit. It serves as a fundamental training for your software engineering brain, proving you possess the crucial problem solving muscle required to pass interviews. I think of a software engineer doing lead code like an athlete going to the gym. LeBron isn't bench pressing on the court, but that consistent work ethic in the gym allows him to be much more successful when he's actually on the court. A lot of people will grind lead code for a few months, then get a job or not, and then they quit for years. And when they're fired or they're laid off or they want to switch jobs, they're screwed. See, companies use lead code as a domain specific IQ test to assess problem solving skills and basic data structures knowledge at scale. Consistent, regular practice over months and years ensures you are prepared when interview opportunities arise. Lesson number 14 is to apply the 80-20 principle or the Pareto principle to maximize your return on investment when it comes to lead code. So you want to concentrate intensely on the high frequency topics that appear in 90 to 95 percent of entry level coding interviews. Research from AlgoMonster suggests that 85 percent of coding interviews focus only on topics like arrays, hashing, trees, graphs, two pointers, linked lists, and DFS slash BFS. You want to avoid wasting your time on low ROI areas like lead code hearts or complex dynamic programming, as those are rarely tested at the entry level. Lesson number 15 is that accountability is everything and you must start a lead code club. See, willpower is often insufficient for sustaining the lead code grind. Nobody, including me, likes lead code, which is why you need some kind of external structure to make it even happen. And the best way to do that is create external accountability by forming a small, dedicated lead code club that's roughly three to six committed people. This structure addresses the procrastination problem. And the way it does that is through healthy competition. You're competing with friends who are also trying to get jobs and internships in tech, which motivates consistent practice and accelerated learning. You'll want to meet ideally three times a week for 90 minutes and focus on pre-selected problems, usually two to three lead code mediums and a couple of easier warmups. Lesson number 16 is to master the behavioral interview and stop only focusing on your technical skills. See, behavioral interviews are so foundational that there are tons of companies who don't even do technical interviews, they only do behaviorals. And every single company uses behaviorals to assess potential contribution and cultural fit. You'll want to consistently practice the STAR framework, which is situation, task, action, result. And the most important aspect of that is actually the result, which has to be quantified with numbers and action verbs. Now, if you're going for a target company like Amazon, you want to incorporate their core values, i.e. the leadership principles, into your answers to signal to the recruiter and engineer that you have cultural alignment. Lesson 17 is to use the systematic approach PBOI or PBOI when facing your lead code problems. PBOI stands for paper, brute force, optimize and implement. And that's exactly what you do step by step when you tackle a lead code problem. You want to start with pen and paper to actually conceptualize the problem before moving on to brute force. You want to be able to walk through the whole problem by hand, understand how the question works and then implement the brute force solution while understanding the time and space complexity of that. Then you can move on to optimizing 
optimizing it by hand. And finally, once you optimize it, you know what the time and space complexity is optimally, then you want to actually implement that optimal solution. This process forces clear thinking and prevents a mistake of prematurely jumping into coding. Now that you understand the mindset required to succeed in software engineering, let's talk about the professional skills to push your career ahead. Lesson 18 is that you'll want to use the Feynman method for programmers. When you're in lecture or in a meeting at work, you want to avoid passively consuming information, and you want to actually utilize the Feynman method, which means that every time you hear an abstract concept, you want to summarize it in your own words, almost like you're teaching someone else. And this can be achieved through a two-phase system. Ideally, you want to pre-read the textbook and pre-learn the information before the lecture or meeting. And then during the meeting or lecture, you fill in the gaps of your understanding and use that time to ask questions. This process ensures deep understanding and retention as writing forces clarity. Lesson 19 is to sharpen the ax. That means continuously working on improving your personal effectiveness to gain efficiency. This means you want to dedicate time to learning new productivity tools and systems, especially in the age of AI, where every other week there's a new AI tool, model, or update to the pre-existing AI stack coming out. So the only way you can stay competitive is if you devote several hours every single week to just sharpening the axe. So mastering new AI tools, learning how to use the models better, and just learning general productivity tools and tactics as a whole. I use several tools like Notion for knowledge management, fantastic to Cal for time blocking and planning my calendar and things three for managing my tasks, as well as ChatGPT, Pro and Claude for writing. Additionally, you want to be consuming nonfiction books, especially in the productivity space, so you can constantly learn how to improve your skills and your output. Lesson number 20 is to keep a paper trail and practice over communication. Now, this is especially useful if you're doing an internship or you're in the workplace, because it's your responsibility to over communicate your progress and success to your manager and stakeholders. So your manager when you're a software engineer is not responsible for finding out what you accomplished and what you did. You have to show up to them and sell why you're worth being promoted. And the best way to do this is by maintaining a paper trail. And the best way to maintain a paper trail is to create a Slack channel with you, your manager, and any relevant stakeholders, and then send a daily beginning of day and end of day report. So they can just see a steady stream of work you're doing. And then in a one-on-one, -on -one, you can always go to that Slack and scroll down the list and show them what you've done so far. And this is vital for successful performance reviews as you need a solid stack of evidence or a brag sheet to justify promotions. This protocol leverages the availability bias, ensuring your managers are consistently aware of your performance, even if they don't respond to every message. Lesson 21 is to adopt Edisonian iteration, and this protocol will guarantee you get a return offer or a promotion. Essentially, you want to constantly try new things, seek feedback, reflect and adjust immediately. In fact, you want to proactively ask your manager or mentor for feedback regularly, aiming for three times a week instead of waiting for your scheduled performance reviews. This relentless seeking of criticism forces you to correct mistakes quickly and provides a clear roadmap for success as the person starting on day one is rarely qualified for a full-time role or senior level role. Lesson 22 is to stop asking stupid questions. See, if you ask trivial or stupid questions to your senior engineer or manager, it drains their goodwill balance. Instead, you want to demonstrate competence by doing the heavy lifting first, and only if you still can't pass it, then asking them for help. See, your nuanced question should address the remaining 5% knowledge gap instead of asking them to do all of the work for you. At my company, we practice the 131 system. So anytime my employees or teammates are allowed to ask me, the CEO, a question, they have to first identify one question to be answered, then they have to send me three recommendations or ideas of things they've tried or options, and finally give one golden recommendation that they think the best answer is. If you just do that every time you ask someone for help, it shows that you're doing the thinking and you're only asking them to confirm the last 5%, which will turn them into a valuable career advocate. Lesson 23 is to develop the psychological resistance to handle the unstructured environment of professional software engineering. See, unlike school, where you're being spoon-fed everything, every problem has a clear rubric and single answers, real-world engineering requires solving open-ended challenges non-linearly. You must be prepared for long periods, months at a time of zero progress before a breakthrough occurs. I like to call this kicking down a door. You can be kicking that door for weeks and weeks and weeks and you'll feel no progress until the door slams open and then you find the next door. So you need to be able to work independently without needing constant direction from a manager. Lesson 24 is going all the way back to the beginning and to recognize that you must start before you're ready, especially in the world of entrepreneurship. Most software engineers I talk to eventually want to do their own thing, whether it's starting a software company or building a brand on social media. And most people succumb to the idea trap where they feel like they need to wait years for the number
number one perfect business concept that they're going to work with. But the truth is that your first business venture, whether it's a social media company, a software company, is very likely to fail because you have no experience in entrepreneurship. Instead, you want to work through all your failures, your first five to 15 companies, so that you can get to the 16th, 17th, or 18th one, which is actually a success. And that way you actually learn the skills of marketing, execution, sales, leadership. See, imagine if starting a successful company is like benching two plates at the gym. Imagine I never even bench press because I'm like, I can't bench two plates. You don't realize that you need to work your way up to actually creating a successful offer and a successful venture. Now, if you're ready to stop guessing and start winning and execute this entire system to land your dream offer guaranteed, check out the Software Engineering Accelerator or the top link in the description. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.